Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. If you're writing a book, or in the beginning stages of writing a book, it's because you have a story within you. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this episode, I'll be speaking with author Sarah Elmore about her debut book, The Knowing. We will discuss her journey to becoming a published novelist, what obstacles she faced, and her inspirations. We will also test her 80s teen movie knowledge in a quiz at the end of the show, so stay tuned for that. So, without any further ado, let's begin. The Knowing by Sarah Elmore The forests of Lyle Mountain have always served as a safe haven for six-year-old Sheridan and her doll Becca when fleeing from her stepfather's drunken rampages, until the night a new brutal predator enters her harrowing world, his intent to annihilate her. As if it is foretold, her existence threatens to reveal the heinous wrath he maliciously inflicts upon his unsuspecting victims. Within the same dark hours, 10-year-old Derek Young's life is shattered when his mother is murdered on Lyle Mountain. His father becomes the prime suspect. Clairvoyant energy enters Derek's world, the night of his mother's passing. However, his gifts are short-lived and replaced with a deep-rooted affliction from the loss of his parents. Sixteen years later, Derek and Sheridan's story begins. The premise of the knowing is to protect and guide those born with psychic abilities. Unspoken laws have been broken, which cause pre-written paths to shift. The consequences are deadly. The realignment of pre-written paths rests on the shoulders of two damaged souls living worlds apart. Fate must bring them together to solve the unsettling riddles from their past and uncover the identity of the monster responsible for shifting the natural order. The evolution of mankind hinges on the reckoning of their enigmatic journey. Get your copy of The Knowing by Sarah Elmore at Amazon.com. All right, and I am back here with the author, Sarah Elmore. And Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm breathing. It's always a good day when I'm breathing. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so now, when did you actually begin writing? Um, I actually started dabbling in writing in uh, middle school. Uh, there was a there was a poetry contest, and I took a stab at it. It was the first time I'd ever attempted, and it, it was it's kind of a horror story actually. Um, but I wrote this poem, and I entered into a statewide competition, and I was initially picked as one of the um, the finalists. And um, my teacher, Mrs. Wilson, I'll never forget her name. Can't remember one other teacher, but um, told me that she didn't feel that someone of my age could actually write something. Um, that good, basically, to put it in simple terms. And it broke my heart. So I didn't write for a long time. Um, and then I started dabbling in writing songs when I was a teenager, some poetry, um, and never really did anything with it. Just, you know, kind of did it as a hobby. And then when I was in my mid-20s, I was asked to be a guest columnist um, for a couple of human interest stories in um, our local newspaper that were relating around, it was it was actually back when um, September 11th was around and the anthrax uh, and then the Halloween scare, like should we send our kids out? So contributed to that. So wrote wrote a few few columns um, as a guest columnist, and um, that was about it until 2010 when craziness happened with my novel. Wow. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what sparked the premise behind the story. I mean, The Knowing is, is the name of your book. Um, what sparked the whole premise? Because you got a couple of kids. You, you, just let us know what's going on here. Well, the premise of The Knowing basically stemmed, I know this is going to sound weird, but it, it stemmed from love, fate, and fear. And what I mean by that is pretty much life, you know what I mean, in a nutshell. Um 
I don't know how to say it except that, you know, the, the beautiful challenges and distractions that we're all faced with. Um, and then I tried to use that, my own experiences, others' experiences, um, and blend it into an entertaining story that people could relate to but also be entertained by. Um, so the premise was basically just stemmed on life, maybe my own experiences or things I saw other people experience. Yeah, you know, you kind of you kind of bring up a, a really good point there about your book being about fate, love, and fear. And the greatest part about fiction or any kind of book is that you have these little pockets of life lessons, okay? Now, you can take somebody's life and expand it out, and you're going to have the same three things, fate, love, fear, okay? It's yeah. going to happen, okay? But then sometimes you might have a chapter that has those three elements. Sometimes you might have a whole book. In any case, we go through those those conflicts all the time, and it's amazing that you've you've done it in such a way that somebody can look at a book like yours and say, wow, you know, I learned something within this book, not just that these characters interacted, but a little bit about myself, you know, and I, I congratulate you for that because that's, like you said, it's kind of like the motivation of this whole story. And you are 100% correct. And, and when you ask what the premise was and, and maybe even the motivation, it was that. It was, I wanted it to be truth, um, but sometimes in truth we have to entertain. I mean, that's our world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but it was very important to me to sprinkle messages about life, uh, strength, perseverance, um, the not so good stuff, but also prevailing and, and finding love and all of that and forgiveness, all of it. Um, and it was challenging. It was very challenging to figure out a way to do that um, within a fiction story. But it happened somehow. It happened by the grace <laughs> of God. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have, yeah, you have two main characters that are intertwined in a very unique way. Um, how does their interaction add to the story in the beginning and also after they grow up? That's actually a very important question. Um, I think because I struggled with this in the beginning, um, you know, I have obviously read other books, I've seen movies and other things that have inspired me, my own, my own personal experiences. But with writing part one with Derek and Sheridan, Sheridan being six and Derek being 10, I felt it was very important that I illustrate what they went through. Um, you know, they... <laughs> Sheridan Dirk's story had to be told basically at an early age, you know, with their unfamiliar words tragically falling apart. Um, understanding basically what they endured as children helped kind of lay off the foundation and understanding their personalities and how they developed as adults. Um, and again, obviously, I don't want to give too much away, but they both experienced horrific tragedies as children, which, you know, played a huge role in who they became in at, at 22 and 26 in part two. Um, which was basically two individuals that, you know, were conditioned to build protective walls around um, their worlds and, and keep their childhood monsters at bay or, or you know, and, and it was preventing them from finding love at some level. So, again, just like in real life, you know, we aren't conditioned to hate. We're not conditioned to fear. We're not conditioned to have all these things happen um in the beginning, but that's who we become as adults and, and why we act or maybe do some of the things that we do as adults. Um, so with these two characters, I just felt it was important that people understood that they went through some stuff, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and they were preventing themselves from finding love and peace because of, of, of their childhood and people needed to understand where that came from. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And you know, one thing too, with, you know, putting up walls, adults still do that. A lot of adults even have a hard time loving themselves because they've put up so many walls throughout their life. And, you know, yeah. a story like yeah. yours could really kind of open up some doors for people. Because honestly, when when you see, and this is just my personal belief, but whenever I see a story that's a fictional story that relates to a, either a tough time in my life or an a tougher time than I've experienced. You, you sympathize real quick with your characters. And I yeah. think, yeah, you've done an excellent job on that as well. So now who has inspired you as an author? Oh, that, that's actually an easy question. I mean, you know, um, my father. Um, and again, I, I think I told you when we, we first connected that, you know, I wanted to be forthright and honest about everything. And, um, 
But my father is basically who inspired me. He he struggled with his own demons as a child and, you know, later on in life, um, ultimately turned into alcoholism. Um, but one thing for sure, he was a hell of a writer. And, you know, after I became a mom at the, you know, early age of 19, let's put it out there, um, he, he shared his writing with me. And there were short stories, poems, love letters to my mom. Um, all of it, his his own personal thoughts, his past, his everything. I mean, he just shared everything with me. He became vulnerable. And my dad was not a vulnerable guy. Um, so this really, really connected us. Um, but it helped me understand who he was truly as a person and, and what he'd been through and had actually overcome. Um, you know, and his, his lifelong dream, 100%, was to become a legit writer and, you know, have his name published in a book one day and... Um, you know, the alcoholism got in the way, his own belief in himself got in the way. Um, and then by the time he finally, he did finally quit drinking, um, in 2010, he got diagnosed with cancer. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, and he never got to fulfill his dream. Um, he passed away in 2012. But he was the reason I finished my novel. And uh, his name is obviously dedicated, you know, to him. But, yeah, he was he was my inspiration through the good, bad, the ugly, all of it. Um, he because he w- became vulnerable to me, you know, closer to my adult years. It just really inspired me to learn how to forgive, um, to look at the beauty in all things, because sometimes on the surface, something looks ugly, but there is something beautiful within it. I don't know if that makes sense, but to answer your question, it was my father. Yeah, well, it definitely makes a lot of sense. You know, it's kind of funny how much a paper and a pen can do for your psyche. And yeah, it doesn't matter if you're a writer or not. It doesn't matter if you're somebody who doesn't believe that they could be in a vulnerable situation. Once that paper and pen is in front of you and you have the opportunity to put that stuff down on paper and you know, thank God that your dad was able to share it with you as well. It's, it's something that really pulls the stuff that needs to be pulled out of, of yourself onto a page. And, you know, I haven't talked to many writers who've really probably admitted that, but I can almost yeah. guarantee that, that a lot of them do, you know, they use that paper and pencil and it can be the best psychologist they've ever had because it does get those emotions out. And if they can express it in one way or another, then they'll come up with a story to write around it. And, um, you know, I, I just hope that that your dad is looking down on you now seeing you writing this book because um, he he should be really proud. Yeah, and, and my mom actually said that to me. I mean, he passed away before I was able to finish it and uh, – but beyond that, um, that's what she said is, is that there, there's no question. Um, my writing this book actually connected my father and I, which we might get into later or may not, but, um, it just really, like I said, the, the, the biggest thing for me and how he inspired me was, was just being honest about where he came from, what he'd been through, what he needed to do to persevere. And it just, it, it, it allowed me to understand who my father was. And, and I have stacks. That's, you know, he didn't have money. We were very poor growing up. But the one thing that he did leave me was all of his writings. And while they may not be in chronolo- excuse me, chronological order, his writings were so powerful, just so powerful. So to your point, yes, very therapeutic for him and probably how he was able to get through life, you know? Yeah, exactly. Now, now your book has taken some time to write. It's your debut novel. Yeah. yeah. And and not just that, but it was a life mission for you. Now, would you care to share with yeah. us the story of how you started dabbling in writing and, and actually hit this five-star novel? I mean, from point A to point B, okay, there's struggles and everything, but you took a time right. off. Could you explain what happened there? Well, yes. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to start by, by letting you know kind of a funny story on a lighter note. Um you know, because when you're raised a certain way you or you've lived a certain life, you, you start to question your self-worth. Mm-hmm. Um, I happen to have a friend, um, one of my dearest friends, one of my best friends, um, 
Crystal, who he's always believed in me and thought I had something where the writing thing was concerned. So back in 2010, this is the funny, um, <laughs> she out of the blue for Christmas said, hey, you know, uh, what I want you to do for my Christmas present this year is to write one chapter of a book for me. That's what I want from you for Christmas. And I thought she was crazy. I thought she was insane. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why? And she's like, because that's what I want. I mean, that's, that's what I want. So I was like, all right. So I'll do that if you learn how to play Bella's Lullaby on the piano, because she always wanted to learn how to play the piano. <laughs> and it, it was just like a little, it was just a game. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Um, and I realized now what she was doing, but at the time I didn't. So I was like, all right, I'll write a chapter of a book. And um, so I wrote the, the chapter. And of course, as promised, I delivered it to her for Christmas. And she cheered up and she said, Sarah, you, you really, really, really need to keep going with this. This is, this is exceptional. It's really good. And, you know, she's my friend. So I'm just thinking she's just trying to, you know, be a friend and uh, get me to do something that I actually love doing. And I was like, I'm not sure, but you know what? I'm up for the challenge. So I went ahead and wrote three more chapters. I wrote three more chapters, which meant I had four. And she read those, said they were great. And I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to keep doing this, I need to go to the one person who I know without question will be forthright with me. And so my dad was 45 minutes away. I took four of those chapters to him. And before he read them, um, I asked him to read them. And I said, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book and I've written four chapters. I would, I would love it if you would read, read these chapters. And of course, you know, he went into dad mode and gave me a lecture about <laughs> how, you know, it's really important that, you know, I don't jump into this or dive into it until I, you know, take some writing courses or getting a write, get a writing degree, something. And I think he was just trying to be protective because he didn't want me to pour my heart into something that was going to fail. Because again, he, he never wrote a book. He, he wanted more for me. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it almost crushed me to the point where I was like, you know what, maybe this isn't the right thing for me to do because I didn't think he believed in me. And um, so I drove 45 minutes home. I left the chapters with them and I got to my house and my house phone was blowing up and it was my dad and they call me Renee. Mm -hmm. Um, My name is Sarah Renee Elmore, but they've always called me Renee. And I answered the phone and it was my dad. And in the most excited voice I've ever heard him in, he was, he was Southern, um, but said, Renee, he's like, do not listen to a word I said. This book is good, or these chapters are good, and they are damn good. They're special. I don't know how in the hell you've done this, but you don't listen to a word I said. You keep going. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it was crazy. And I'm like, I mean, it's just that's what ignited, no pun intended because you read the book, but that's what ignited the light within me was his belief mm-hmm. that I could do this. I'm like, okay, now I know I'm onto something because my dad wouldn't say it unless he meant it. And, so I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going with it. And so I did. Um, and another thing about my dad, I know I'm talking a lot about him, but he's a big part of this. So mm-hmm. he, um, you know, I'm writing these chapters. He was having chemo because, again, he was diagnosed in 2010. He was going through chemo, going through radiation, couldn't really leave the house, was, you know, very sick. And so he decided that for every chapter that I wrote, he wanted me to bring it to him so that I could then – um, so that he could then read the chapters out loud to my mom. And that became their date night. Wow. Which also, yeah, I mean, in the vision of that, I'm not going to start crying again, but the vision <laughs> of that kept me going. Like, I mean, this is something that, we're, you know, us as a family are involved in. And, and he was just so extremely proud. And it gave him and my mom something to bond over. So, so yeah, that's, uh, so there was that. So then he, again, passed away in 2012. And I had been moving right along. It was uh, March of 2013, never forget it. And I was diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia, which in the medical books is known um, as the most painful disorder known to mankind. And because of the anti-seizure medications that I had to take, um, you know, in order to control the quantity of attacks that I was having a day, my cognitive thinking was off. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad had passed away, you know, I was already upset about that. You know, now I'm, you know, I was in marketing, I was making good money. I've lost my job now. I'm on disability. I can't even, I can't even begin to write like I did in the previous chapters because my brain just wasn't there. Mm-hmm. So, so I sat on a side and I did like what most people do. You know what I mean? It, it, I don't know that it was that I gave up, but I just didn't, 
believe that I could do it. And so and then uh, about three and a half years ago, I was going through my computer, um, and I came across a manuscript. And I started just kind of browsing over it. And I thought to myself, you know, this book started out as a way to to move people, to inspire people. Again, entertaining story with sprinkled with inspiring messages and motivation. As horrible as some of the things are, you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. To inspire. And, and I'm a hypocrite because all these messages that I wanted to share with the world and for anybody that needed it, here I am giving up. You know what I mean? And yeah. so, again, thought about my dad reading those chapters to my mom and, and, and everything that had led up to that point. And I said, you know what? I don't care how long it takes. I will write the last three and a half chapters of this book and they will be as good, if not better than the ones before. So three and a half years later, and I got those three and a half chapters finished, but that was the, that was the delay in finishing it. And, you know, I had a lot of supporters in the beginning that were rooting me on and I had some readers reading it as I was going and then it just stopped. But one of my biggest accomplishments is that I, I pushed myself through, through the pain, through the disorder, through, life in general and and got it done yeah and you know that's another thing too with like people that support you around you right you know i've seen people like this and in one thing like especially if you see somebody with a lot of talent and you see that they're kind of hitting a hard spot in their life and you kind of want to just push them and say yeah why don't you go back to writing that book why don't you the one thing that i would highly not suggest is pushing people to do that because just like you, you pushed yourself. It was like when you were ready to finish this book, you took it on. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that hit those moments for other reasons, but they hit those moments in their writing where, where it's like a standstill. And it may be something that they're doing themselves or maybe something that's completely out of control and, um, or out of their control. So, Honestly, I just want to say that it's really inspirational, and I would never say that you're a hypocrite for taking a break on this because you have experienced some really major things that not many people can say that they've experienced in their life. So um, I, I think I'm going to reject that that uh, notion of you being a hypocrite. <laughs> I'm just going to call you an inspirational writer um, because that's really what you are. And so, yes, and, and that's another question I have here. Now, your book, because it is a fictional story, it does have a plot and everything, but it has these little things sprinkled into it. What is, like, the main focus of your book? What do you want your readers to take away from this? Oh, gosh, um, so much. I want, them, I want them to take away that, you know, we, we all struggle in life. We all go through something. You know, like I have my disorder with TN and it's, and it's, and it's hard, but somebody else has their own kind of pain or their own challenges. What I want them to take away from this is if, if you keep pushing, if you just keep pushing toward the light, so to speak, um, you can persevere and not to say that just because you wake up one day and say, Hey, I'm going to do this. It's going to happen. But, you know, find that will, please find that will to keep moving full force towards your dreams because I don't want to say if I can do it, anyone can, because that's not what it's about. But essentially that is the message. You know, we all go through it. We all go through something. Please, you know, just keep moving, keep moving toward whatever it is, whether it's writing a book, um, whether it's getting over, you know, your childhood or achieving a goal, um, Whatever it is that you want to do in life, it, it, it can happen, but you have to be open and willing to a sense of peace, you know, finding peace within yourself to get it done. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it you does. Know, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, um, it might not just, yeah. yeah, it might not just be a book that you're writing. It might be anything. I'll, I'll tell you a story about me. Um, I had written a book and uh, it didn't do so hot. Um, it took me almost three years to write. I finally pulled it off the shelf because for one, I struggled through it, right? It was something that I I enjoyed. I enjoyed reading. I love reading. I love experiencing new things, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I gave up on it. Okay. Now I'm doing this. And this right here gives me a, a, a very fulfilling sense of what I'm doing is right. And, you know, when you find that thing, you know, even the journey to find that thing that you should be doing, you know, don't stop looking for it. 
you know, because, I mean, just like you said, you have to follow that light. You have to follow exactly what your dream is, no matter what it is. So, I mean. And accept the challenges. Yeah. And accept the challenges that are, are guaranteed to come in your way. I mean, we, like I said, we all have them. But, you know, accept those, accept those challenges on your journey. Um, and if you can do that and accept that they're, they will be there and they will exist and then try to figure out a way to overcome them, no matter what outlet that is for you. Just keep moving, keep getting up every day, rolling out of bed and doing the right thing by yourself and, and our world. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like try to bring the fiction home. That's what I'm saying. But, Isn't that right? <laughs> no, I don't know. I just made that up. I don't even know if it makes any sense. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's good. I might put that in a quote, but I'll, I'll, I'll make the name on it. <laughs> oh, there you go. So now you you are an inspirational person, okay? Just just talking to you for the last, uh, let's see here, 23 minutes. Um, you're a very, very inspirational person. How do you help other people be inspired? Oh, gosh. I mean, I don't know that I'm an inspiration to others. I, I hope that I am. I, I certainly do try to do my part, but, um, you know, in the book, again, you've read it, there are mentions of, you know, different organizations, um, related to the cancer, um, foster children, um, abuse and rape victims. Um, and me personally, I take each one of those very, very seriously because they've either affected my life in one way or the other or those that I love. So what I've done even, you know, prior to the book and especially, you know, since and after the book is each year I try to organize um, fundraisers to help raise money for the causes I believe in, um, uh, as well as donate, you know, portions of my profits or proceeds that I make from my novel. Um, and I also, I also create crafts. Uh, I'm a craft rebel. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> I can make some things. <laughs> um, and I, and I use those crafts and, and the profits from the crafts to also donate to the causes. One thing I wanted to incorporate in the book, and, and it was there, but my editor, boy, she, she made me hack some stuff, is, uh, is our veterans. Um, and Sheriff, Sheriff Reed, whom I'm assuming, you know, obviously, you know, mm. it, there was a mention of that in there for him because I wanted to get it in there, but, you know, you have to hack some things out. But so, you know, listen, and, and beyond the money portion of it or organizing these fundraisers, you know, I'm a true believer especially as a starving artist. I know firsthand that sometimes it's, it's really, really difficult to give financially when you don't have it, but it, it doesn't always take money to help someone and, or possibly even save a life. You just, you know, I, in fact, I just recently wrote a quote um, that I live by and truly believe in. And, and I, and I wish the world could embrace this, but seriously, just the quote is offering a beautiful smile or kind word to a complete stranger and help change the human spirit and not just theirs, but your own. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I try to do. I try to encourage people to do that, to be kind to one another, to, to know that you can do more, not just the, the money component of it, but there's more that you can do to really change someone. And by helping others, ultimately you're helping yourself. You know what I mean? There's just yeah. a feeling when you do that, that is so rewarding. It, it, you almost can't even put it into words. It's, 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 it's moving. Yeah, and, and that's another thing, too. Like you said, you know, follow that light. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there in some really dark spots. But then sometimes it's really nice to have somebody who's waving the flashlight at the front of the room saying, hey, we can help you. You know, it really does make a difference because, honestly, you've seen people in situations and, you know, they might might be somebody who has no hope whatsoever, Having somebody there to say, hey, let me let me just, you know, flick this little light on for you and give you maybe another direction. You know, that's a huge difference in somebody's life. It might be something small, it might be something very, very tiny. But everything simple, that we yeah. yeah, everything that we do impacts somebody else's life in a good way or, or a negative way. And the best part is is if you're somebody who believes in good mm -hmm. things, then try to impact people on the positive side more often. And I do appreciate that because all around the story is good. You're a great person. Um, it, it's been an amazing talk with you. Um, I do have another question because you had mentioned um, that you might have something else on the horizon. Do you plan on making a sequel to this book? Yes, um, I do. I actually, you know, and, and my readers, I, I, I love the readers that have responded um, or reached out to me 
Um, that is their biggest thing is when is the next book? And I wish I had to give to them right this second. I want them to know that it is in the works. <laughs> the outline is there and all the, the crazy spots and twists and reveals and all of that will be incorporated into number two and three. I do plan on making this a trilogy. All right. Um, yeah, so, so definitely. And right now I'm actually in the process of, um, the knowing being produced into an audiobook. Oh, cool. um, that will be published on Audible. Um, my hope is it's going to be out by the end of the month, fingers crossed. Um, but again, if you read the knowing as it is right now, it could essentially end just the way it is. Uh, but there's just more work to do for me. And so, yeah, there, there will definitely be, be another book. Wow. Now, you are somebody who just had a debut novel. And yeah. so you are a new writer, but you're not really a new writer. You're a new author, published author, okay? Yeah. Somebody who's just getting started, what advice would you give them other than the advice that you've already given? Because honestly, I think that if they just read your book, they would be inspired to write whatever they want to do. <laughs> um, and as they should, yes. Yeah. So what advice would you give somebody who's just starting out? The advice that I would give somebody starting out um, – well, again, let me just give you a quick synopsis of my own backstory to set, set up my advice. Um, I left home when I was 15. I got married at 16, had my first child at 19, was divorced by 21, wow. and then remarried to the love of my life, um, whom I've been married to for 22 years now. Well, 20 years. We've been together for 22 years. Um, and obviously, that wasn't an easy journey, right? Mm -hmm. So... My advice to anyone, regardless if you have a background of mine or you, you know, have a, a better background, whatever it is, if you're writing a book or in the beginning stages of writing a book, it's because, you know, you have a story within you. You just have to believe in yourself and, and let your story naturally flow through yourself. Um, and then the writer's block, you know, <laughs> if you don't get, if you don't get writer's block, you're just not human and we can't be friends. But um, <laughs> when, you do, <laughs> when you do experience it, um, one of the advice I've been giving to other authors that I've been communicating with is writer's block is a big thing. So, you know, I love music. I love all different kinds of music um, from Blake Shelton to Bach. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you get writer's block, maybe close your eyes and listen to, to music that moves you or makes you feel, inspires you. And then write the scenes, you know, that you visualize within your mind down. Um, there's, there's so many chapters of my own book that I got through that writer's block by just doing that. Um, maybe hire a, a prof not maybe, definitely, 100% <laughs> hire a professional editor. Mm -hmm. um, seriously, without mine, my novel, my novel would have been like 350 pages longer than it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to let go of some of your words because we're passionate about what we write. Um, but a good editor will encourage you to cut the words, scenes, and oftentimes chapters. That was really, really hard. Um, but don't move your story forward. Um, it might distract the reader. So I think having an editor is, is definitely key. And finally, breathe. You know, just, just don't forget to breathe and remember what sparked that, that interest in even sitting down and, and putting pen to paper or, you know, with today's technology, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, don't, <laughs> don't forget what sparked it, because again, if, if if you're thinking about it or you're doing it now, it's because the story is in you. You just have to figure out ways to help it come out. And and I said finally on the last one, but this one was kind of important um, and kind of funny. I remember I had lots of distractions, obviously, when I was writing this book, and I was getting this was the last three and a half chapters. In fact, I think it's one of the last scenes, and I remember a lawnmower outside on the street running for almost four hours with uh, a trailer behind it pulling kids. They were out there playing with their dad's mower. And I'm trying to finish this book, but I'm getting distracted, right? And, and again, I know you've read the book, but there is definitely a scene at the end where I took that distraction and that frustration and I, I, I put it in as a piece of the book. It helped me get over my writer's block. Um, yeah, <laughs> and help me help me finish the scene, which was so crazy. But I wish I'd have would have used those those techniques early on in the book to get over some of, some some of the times that I had the writer's block. Use what you know. Use your experience. Even use those distractions to build characters, scenes, um, whatever it may be. 
Yeah, because again, the most important thing is breathe. <laughs> yeah, because uh, YouTube videos about cats doesn't always work. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love I, cats. Yeah, I want I to love snuggle cats. with them all. I want to snuggle with them all. <laughs> yeah, I, I could spend hours. And the, puppies. Just, the funny cat videos just make me laugh so hard. But uh, <laughs> seriously, though, on that note, to be, this is another thing that I did. I'm going to throw it out there, but I will go on YouTube literally if I'm just having a weird day. You know, I've, I've already spilled a cup of coffee or, you know, whatever the case may be. I will go on YouTube and I will find something inspirational to watch. Usually Ellen, because she makes me laugh. I like Ellen um, a lot. Just kind of, oh, my God, I adore her. But, you know, just find something inspirational that you can watch on YouTube that will make you laugh or feel or whatever. So those are other things, though, that will that'll kind of get you out of that funk and get you motivated and going. Yeah, smiling and laughing does it for me. I, oh, gosh, me I love too. laughing. <laughs> so, me too. Anyhow, I would like to thank you so much for being here on the show. Um, thank you, Anna. And Thank I have you. one more request from you. Yeah. Okay. Would you mind playing a trivia game with me? Oh, my God. I wouldn't mind at all. Okay. Here we I go. I good book, so don't judge me on my answers, but all right. Go ahead. <laughs> don't worry, because <laughs> the category for these uh, trivia questions is 80s teen movies. So. Okay. Oh. Here we go. I'm going to ask all you a right. question, and then you have to give me the name of the movie. It should be fairly straightforward, but let's see how well this goes. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. Question one. What movie took place in a school library during a weekend detention? The Breakfast Club. Correct. (laughs) Yes, very good. (laughs) Question two. The movie, or this movie, was about two nerds who decided to make a girlfriend. Oh, my gosh. You're a science. Yes, Yes, it is. Correct. (laughs) All right. Next one. You're doing really good on this. Uh, The next one. What movie features a phone booth, two radical dudes, and some excellent adventures through time? Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Wow. Yes. Very good. Three for three already. Oh, my gosh. My husband would be so proud. (laughs) Oh, by the way, you do receive... 2,000 points for each correct answer. All right? These points don't mean anything, but you can just store them somewhere. They're like uh, complimentary points. You also get a complimentary point. Oh, and I will. I'll find a place to store them. Trust me. All right. So here's the next question. What movie featured four friends who find a dead body of a child? Stand by me. Yes. Well, I was expecting. Oh, my God. That's really good. That's really good. Okay. Here's the next one. What fantasy love comedy features the line, and I'm going to do this properly, I'm going to have to do this properly, inconceivable. Oh, gosh. Inconceivable? It's a fantasy love comedy. Fantasy love comedy. Inconceivable. Oh, my gosh, you might have got me on this one. I don't think I know it. All right, I'll give you the answer. It was The Princess Bride. Oh my gosh, I love that movie. How, how can I not know that? Yeah, and that guy who's always in there. Inconceivable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love yeah, that yeah. guy. All right, here's the next one. We can redeem yourself here. All right. Okay. All right. This one should be fairly simple. I, I put way more clues in this one than I should have probably done. Okay, here we go. What Kevin Bacon and Laurie Singer movie is set in a place where rock and roll dancing is banned? So easy, but loose. One yes. of my favorites. Yes, correct, correct. I learned to dance. I learned to dance when I was a teenager, or actually I was younger than a teenager, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Love that movie. <laughs> okay, here's the next one. What Christmas movie features the line, no, you'll shoot your eye out? A Christmas story. Yes. That is our tradition every year. We watch it 24 hours, yes. I know, I know it's coming up too, you know? I mean, it's going to be on every channel here soon. All right, here we go. The next question. What movie is about a young man who skips school? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yes, very be. correct. Wow. Yay! Wow, very good. Uh, you know, okay, here's the next one. All right. What movie is about a young man who befriends a scientist and travels back to in time to save his parents' relationship? Back to the future. Wow, you did a really good job. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Wow, I think you've gotten the most out of everybody here. Okay, so we here we go. This is the bonus okay. question, okay? 
you can clear that whole uh, Princess Bride thing out of the way by winning, get this, 2,926.5 points, okay? Oh my gosh, I gotta get it, I gotta get it. Yep, and this is this is for all the questions ever answered for anybody across the 80s. <laughs> Um, the Pyramid Show, uh, Jeopardy, anything, this would just make everybody happy because it would be distributed to their points. Okay, here we go. I will be the ultimate champion. All yes. right, let's go. The ultimate champion. Bonus question. <laughs> what movie features Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey performing in a dance competition during a summer at the Catskills Resort? Because I have the time of my life. Dirty Dancing, baby! Yes, it is! Dirty Dancing! (laughs) Yes. What an amazing job. Yes, you did an amazing job on that quiz. So You know what? That's crazy. I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed right now. (laughs) Yeah, well, no, I think what it is is I need to start making these questions harder for people. I think that's really what's going on. Uh, But thank you so much for being on the show. This was a blast. Oh, you, you have been amazing, absolutely. And I love I love your show, and I'm so honored to be a part of it. Thank you so much. No problem. And re- I just want to remind everybody out there, check out The Knowing by Sarah Elmore on Amazon.com. And where else can people find you? Do you have um, any other links or blogs or anything? Yes. Um, actually, my blog is www.sarahelmore.com author.com. All right. And thank you once again for being on the show, Sarah. It was fun. Thank you so much, Emmett. I appreciate that. All right. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. If you're writing a book or in the beginning stages of writing a book, it's because you have a story within you. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 